imitation learning. Uh, so what is imitation learning in a nutshell? Uh, in many tasks, uh, in controls or in actually, actually much more general than controls, but like in you know games, uh, in life, uh, there exists an expert policy which solves the task, right? And uh, but many times relying on this expert is perhaps not desirable. Uh, so why might not be the case? Uh, the expert could be a human. So if you want to build a general purpose, you, know, you want to build a robot that solves a lot of you know home tasks, you can't have a human like accompany this robot, right? Then that would, I mean, that's not the point. So ideally, we don't want to rely on a human demonstrator. Um, alternatively, the expert could may maybe be optimization based, but actually require a lot of computation. So for instance, the expert is a solution to a, you know, NPR problem or an integer program or something like that, right? And uh, that's okay, that's great uh, because it's not a human, but it's very slow and, and maybe not real time. Uh, a third thing, maybe the expert's a black box and you just, you know, for whatever legal reasons, you don't want to rely on a black box. You want to like have your own expert or own policy. And so you have to copy some like, you know, policy that's just like handed to you as a black box. So in all these situations, the goal of imitation learning is to use supervised learning to basically learn a policy that solves a task using demonstrations from the expert. Okay. And, uh, so let's kind of make this more concrete by setting up a, a problem notation. So we're going to work uh, now. We're going to switch gears to, to discrete time. So in the previous part of the talk, we worked in continuous time, but now we're going to work in discrete time. Uh, and so we're going to and we're and we're also going to add control. So we're going to look at discrete time control affine dynamical systems. Uh, so that's going to be x t plus one is equal to f of x t plus g of x t u t. Uh, and we're going to assume uh, that the origin is is the zero, uh, and that x is an R n and u is an R d. So again, we're going to have, as we had in the previous part, we're going to have a distribution over initial states of this uh, dynamical system, uh, psi and x. And uh, in in this part, uh, we can actually generalize this to include things like environmental stochasticity. So in, in this part of the talk, it will actually be more easy to general. So a, a natural question to ask about the first part of the talk is like, what if we have noise? Uh, noise is actually trickier to handle in the Lyapunov, uh, like the stability certificate sense. Uh, but in this imitation learning setup, we can actually handle noise over these uh, uh, trajectories here. Like if we had process noise here. Uh, but for simplicity, I'm going to omit that. I'm just going to put all the noise in initial condition. Um, so for a policy, we're going to again use this flow notation. So for a policy is a mapping from Rn to Rd, and this flow notation E of uh, of pi uh, uh, time t uh, uh, with the argument psi is the dynamical system at x x t, the state of time t, where we play the inputs is according to the policy pi of x t, uh, and we start the the system from the initial state psi. Okay. And we're doing imitation learning, so we're going to have an expert policy. I'm going to use pi star to denote this expert policy. And uh, or I'm going to introduce this notation, which is going to be what I call a weighted policy deviation. So this delta of pi 1, pi 2. And delta of pi 1, pi 2 is going to take a state x, and it's going to evaluate g of x times the difference between what the policy pi 1 would have done at x minus the, the what policy pi 2 would have done at x. So often we'll set pi two to be x to be pi star, in which case pi of pi one pi star would measure the deviation between pi one and the expert at state x, and weighting weighting that deviation with this matrix g of x. Okay, so the weight here g of x is kind of for simplicity. It's actually you could also define the deviation to just be the difference between pi one pi two and x, but it's just more natural to include this g. And we'll see why that is in a moment. Uh, so in imitation learning, right, we basically want to imitate the experts. So we're going to define this thing called an imitation loss. Uh, I'm going to define this imitation loss generally. But as I mentioned before, pi 2 will usually be the expert. Uh, but the imitation loss has actually three policies. So there's a pi prime, a pi 1, and a pi 2. And so pi 1 and pi 2 go into that policy deviation here. So we're going to sum from time 0 to t minus 1 of the policy deviation. Uh, but the important thing is that we're going to use this subscript uh, in the imitation loss L to 
to denote the data generating policy. So pi prime is going to be the policy that's actually generating the state, right? So uh, we we have a phi of t of pi prime initialized at c, and we're going to use those states to evaluate the policy deviations. And t here is going to be the horizon length of the rollout, which we'll fix. Okay. And so what's interesting about uh, uh, imitation learning is that the generalization error of a learn policy uh, is now going to actually take that learn policy pi and going to apply in two places. So we're going to define a generalization error to be the expectation over the initial conditions from D, and we're going to evaluate the imitation loss. We're going to use pi to generate the trajectories in this imitation loss, and we're also going to use pi to compare against the expert. So it's this putting pi in the subscript here and having it generate the, the trajectory is what makes imitation learning hard, right? And we'll see why that is in a moment. But here, I just want to set up the notation. OK, so behavior cloning is the like first basic algorithm in imitation learning. It's like what you would think of if you were tasked to solve this problem. Uh, and it's the idea is, is very simple. What you do is you basically roll, you, you have M expert trajectories. And so basically that's, uh, you draw M initial conditions from D and you roll them out. And so that's this C of pi star of T and you, and, and you collect M of these. And what you do then is you basically ask that the behavior clone policy pi of BC is a minimizer uh, in some policy class pi of the empirical uh, imitation loss where we use the expert to generate the imitation law. So the expert generated trajectories, which is what's happening above, and we're basically gonna compare the policy that we learn to the expert, and we're gonna do it on the expert's trajectory, right? So this is what behavior cloning does. This, you can solve this problem given this data. It may not be obvious from this notation, but this notation only relies on these expert trajectories. Um, I'm using this notation to kind of abbreviate things so we don't have to carry these far fees around. But the point is that you can actually solve this just by looking at the expert trajectories. So this is a purely supervised learning problem here as written. Now, uh, the bound on a generaliza so generalization error, right? Uh, supervised learning is gonna give us bounds on the expected value of the so imitation loss where pi star lives in the, in, in, in this as, is the generating policy, right? So this we can get from supervised learning. But as I mentioned before, the generalization error that we really care about, the behavioral clone policy is the trajectory that we want to use to generate the, 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 the distribution, right? So what makes imitation learning tricky to analyze is what we call this distribution shift between you know, the L of pi star and L of pi behavior clone, right? And so basically it's the idea that when I close the loop with my learn policy, I actually change the distribution of the trajectories that we've seen before because my policy behavior cloning is not going to be equal to the policy pi star at every point. And so anytime I have an error, I'm going to introduce a distribution shift. Even if that error is small, those errors can possibly compound. And that's what makes this uh, imitation learning uh, tricky. Okay. So basically, the this part of the talk is we're going to develop a set of tools to basically analyze, to take the guarantee from stat learning, which is this guarantee on the left, and use a, a stability theory to basically port this guarantee over to the generalization that we actually care about. So that's gonna be basically the, what, what, we, what we try to accomplish in the next two hours. Um, okay, so the, as I mentioned before, the key technical question in analyzing imitation learning is dealing with a distribution shift. And the way we're going, to do, we're going to deal with distribution shift is we're going to look at deviations of trajectories uh, that start from the same initial condition but follow two different policies. Okay. And I'm going to def we're going to use this quantity so much, I'm going to give it a notation. I'm going to say for two different policies, pi 1, pi 2, I'm going to define a discrepancy of t uh, and this discrepancy is going to take three arguments. It's going to take the initial condition and the two policies. And the discrepancy is going to sum from time as t is zero to capital T of the, the state at time t when I follow policy one, pi one, minus the state at time t when I follow policy pi two. Okay, so I'm just going to sum the L2 distance 
of the L2 deviations of the state along this entire trajectory. All right. So now the question that we're going to want to study is can we upper bound this uh, policy, this trajectory deviation by some function of the imitation loss, uh, L of pi one, uh, uh, psi of pi one, pi two, right? And why do we want to do this? Well, we're going to see why we want to do this uh, eventually. But for now, uh, we're going to just study this question and we're going to build us on the tools to actually get um, uh, a bound on this, right? And so the point is that like, we're going to eventually control the imitation loss and we're going to use the, the discrepancy then. We're going to basically then show that by controlling the imitation loss, we can actually control this discrepancy and that's going to allow us to handle the distribution shift. But for now, let's try and upper bound the discrepancy by the imitation loss. Okay, so the first thing to do is we're going to derive a naive bound or what I call the Gronwall bound, named after Gronwall's lemma uh, in, in continuous time. And Gronwall's lemma in continuous time basically is the question of if I have two different ODEs, you know, x dot is f of x and, and y dot is g of x. And if f and g are close, then, you know, x and y should be close, right? And Gronwall gives you a qualitative, uh, quantitative way of bounding that. And so we're going to do, uh, sorry, uh, we're going to do something very similar, but we're going to do it in discrete time. So the first claim is we're going to suppose that everything is bounded in Lipschitz. So B bounded in L Lipschitz. Uh, this is this is just for simplicity. I, I wanted to basically illustrate a, a naive bound that we're not going to use. So let's just make all the assumptions we want here. And uh, I'm going to uh, then claim that the discrepancy is upper bounded by uh, L plus one, uh, L times one plus two beta to the T uh, minus one over that quantity uh, times the imitation loss. So the point here is that this is going to scale exponentially in the horizon and right, it's going to be like L plus one uh, L times one plus two B to the T power. And so this is bad, we don't want this, but this is kind of our first step. Okay, uh, this is a very easy argument. This is this triangle inequality basically. So we're gonna have two trajectories, X and Y. Uh, we're gonna start them at the same initial condition. So X zero psi, Y zero psi. But the difference is that we're gonna have policy one, pi one playing in X and policy pi two playing in Y, okay? And so, uh, by just using algebra, we can basically difference x t plus one minus y t plus one, and you know that's equal to plugging these two quantities in this first expression here. Um, and what we'll do is actually we'll take this first expression and we'll subtract and add g of x t times pi two of x t. Okay, because that sets us, us to use triangle inequality and apply our bounded and Lipschitz conditions. So once we sort of set this up and kind of add and subtract zero. Uh, because everything is bound in Lipschitz, then we can apply triangle inequality to this expression here. Uh, and what the conclusion is, is that xt plus one minus yt plus one, L2 norm, is upper bounded by L plus, times one plus two beta times xt minus yt. So we're setting ourselves up with a recurrence relationship, uh, plus uh, the policy deviation between pi one and pi two evaluated at xt, okay? Uh, and this is why we actually define the policy deviation to include the G because it sort of, otherwise we'd carry an extra factor of B around here, right? So this is just triangle inequality, but this sets up, this basically is a recurrence relation, right? It basically says that, you know, the difference at time T plus one is less than some scalar times the difference at time T plus some perturbation. So we can unroll this recursion. Uh, and then we basically, just by unrolling this recursion, we, we get that the difference at time t is upper bounded by some weighted sum of the discrete policy uh, deviations uh, that we've seen along this entire time from i is zero to t minus one, okay? And therefore, if we sum these up, which is basically the discrepancy, then you know by a little bit of algebra, that's exactly where we get this exponential and horizon, uh, t thing out. And then we can upper bound this by, you know, the exponential in T times the sum of the imitation loss. Basically, this is the weighted policy discrepancies uh, uh, using XT as a generating dis uh, as a generating distribution. So, in conclusion, uh, I didn't write the conclusion, but basically, in conclusion, it's this is the Gronwall bound, what I call the Gronwall bound. Okay, and that's just triangle inequality, basically. Okay, so. Um, the point is, well, okay, we had a bound, we got what we wanted, but to get what we wanted, we had to suffer exponential uh, bounds in horizon length T. 
And for any trivial problem, the horizon is like 100. You know, we don't want to be raising like L to the 100. That's just not a good place to be in, right? So to improve this dependence on the horizon length, we're going to need to use some stability theory. And this is where like notions of incremental stability uh, are going to come into play. So I'm going to start by taking a definition from the controls literature uh, um, from Tran et al. 2016, where they defined uh, incremental input to state stability for discrete time systems. Now, a lot of you may be familiar with uh, input to state stability, uh, but here we're just sort of using that definition and generalizing it to pairs of trajectories. So let's stare at what the definition is going to look like. And so to add to do this definition, I'm going to add a little bit of notation here. So we're going to look at this dynamics uh, xt plus one is f of xt ut, and I'm going to overload this flow map notation uh, phi of t a psi uh, comma uh, a signal u. So what this is saying is that this is going to denote the state at time t, initialize that this initial condition psi, and I'm going to play an input signal ut. Like I don't necessarily have a policy. I'm just going to uh, fix an input signal. Uh, and I'm going to basically uh, play that out and, 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 and use this to denote what the state of time t is going to be if I play this input signal. Okay, now the definition of input to state stability or incremental input to state stability, which we'll abbreviate as delta ISS. So we'll say that the dynamics f is delta ISS if there are two class k, uh, there's a, sorry, if there's one class KL function uh, zeta and one class K infinity function gamma such that for every pair of initial conditions uh, c1 and uh, psi1 and psi2, and every input sequence ut uh, uh, that's living in some sets x and u respectively, uh, and for all time t, we can bound the difference between the state at time t where we play, where we start at psi1 and play the input signal u t, compare it with the state at time t where we start at uh, x2 or psi2 and play the zero input signal. So there's no input signal. We're going to upper bound this difference by uh, uh, zeta of the difference of the initial conditions, comma t, right? So this is basically the effect of the initial conditions, plus a gain. So we're going to evaluate gamma, and we're going to look at the maximum signal, uh, input signal from zero to t minus one that we saw so far. Okay, and so this is what it means to be delta ISS. Okay, this is definition. Uh, uh, ISS is basically this definition where we, you know, don't have this first term. We don't have this, uh, you know, this uh, second trajectory. We only look at one trajectory, right? Okay, so in fact, this is a stronger condition because in particular, if say zero is a fixed point of F, then you can set psi two to zero. Uh, in which case the second quantity is always zero, and then it, it actually then reduces to the definition of, of incremental state stability. So you can think of this as a strictly stronger definition of, of, of uh, stability here. Okay, so what do we do with this definition? Now, let's suppose, let's suppose that this closed loop system, f plus g pi two plus u, so it's a closed loop system, but we're adding an input signal in, right? So uh, we're going to suppose that this thing is delta ISS, okay? And we're going to see what the consequence of this definition gives us. Now, we can take xt plus 1 equals f of xt plus g of xt pi 1. So we're going to look at the closed loop of pi 1, and we're going to basically write it in terms of this closed loop of pi 2, right? And we'll do that by adding and subtracting g of pi 2, which is essentially what we did in the Gronwall proof, right? So basically, we have closed loop of pi one equals closed loop with pi two plus the weighted policy deviation between pi one and pi two, right? This is, this is an algebraic identity, adding and subtracting zero basically. Now that's fine and all, but because we have this assumption that pi two closed loop plus u is delta ISS, we can treat this weighted policy deviation as an input signal to F tilde, right? Because the input signal is arbitrary. so yeah, sure. Let's say, okay, this is our input signal now, all right? And if this is our input signal, then we can write xt, um, uh, sorry, we can write basically, um, uh, what is this one going to be? This is basically xt, right? If xt is basically starting from psi and using this input signal, and yt, which is basically playing pi2, is just, uh, you know, we use no input signal, right, up here. 
We just set the u to zero, okay? And so by the definition of delta ISS, we basically have xt minus yt is less than, the initial conditions are the same, so the first term drops away, and all that's left is this uh, gain factor, so this gamma of maximum of the policy deviations uh, from time zero to t minus one, okay? But the maximum of a bunch of things, the positive terms, is all the way upper bounded by the sum of these positive terms, and class K functions are monotonic, we increasing, so we can upper bound this first gain quantity by the second gain quantity, which is basically gamma, gamma evaluated of uh, where we sum along the policy deviations uh, from k0 to t minus one. And so in particular, if we sum this left-hand side here over t is zero to big T, uh, we can upper bound it by t times gamma of the imitation loss evaluated uh, uh, using pi one as the data generating distribution and evaluating pi one and pi two, okay? And so basically what this does is it allows us to improve the Gronwall estimate, right? The Gronwall estimate had E L, L to the T here. Here we've improved that to T, uh, but the cost we paid was sort of this, uh, you know, class K function thing here, but we've improved uh, exponential dimensions in T, exponential dependence in T to like a linear dependence in T. So it's a huge improvement by assuming some notion of stability. And that's, the, okay, so that's what I just said. Great. Um, However, this is not sharp, right? Because there is one case where the ground wall bound is actually really good. And it's when L plus one, L times one plus two B is less than one, in which case, uh, you know, that exponential term is actually a constant, right? Because it's just like one minus something small to the T power. So uh, there's actually a constant. And in which case, in that case, the ground wall bound actually says that the discrepancy is upper bounded by a constant order one times, uh, um, the imitation loss. So that's like independent of T. So incremental, incremental uh, ISS, delta ISS is not enough here to give us the sharpest dependence on time. So we're gonna basically define a new definition or a more quantitative definition of delta ISS, which is gonna actually allow us to recover, uh, uh, basically allow us to sharpen this, this up a little bit. So that's what we'll do next. Are there any questions here so far? So uh, I would have a question, but so so yesterday, like both I also from from Google was speaking about offline reinforcement learning, and therefore, like he also had to deal with a distribution shift. And his idea was mm -hmm. to kind of use some kind of inverse propensity type of you know like importance type weighted uh, technique to model the distribution shift. Would that potentially also be an option in in, 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 in in imitation learning that you kind of say, okay, you know the expert policy, right? And and uh, you're trying to learn a policy. So basically you could also form the kind of importance weight ratios and deal with that. Is, is that a common technique in, in, in imitation learning? Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't watch this talk yesterday, so I don't know the exact details of it. Um... Uh, to make a to make a more definitive statement, I would think I would have to actually. So I have, I don't know how to answer this question right now because I I didn't really watch what he did yesterday. Um, and I'm not that familiar with this important weight sampling stuff. Um, okay. But uh, I I yeah, guess one so, fundamental difference was we had a finite state and action space, right? So therefore, like the setting was for sure a little bit simpler. I guess you have a continuous state and action space in your mm -hmm. model, I guess. Well, I mean, you could probably generalize those things. Uh, you can, I, you could probably generalize these those things to continuous state and action spaces, but they would become like maybe computationally intractable. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, unfortunately, okay. never mind. I, never yeah, mind. I'm not no. too familiar with that. But that's a good question. So maybe like after watching this, uh, maybe you would actually be in a better place to answer that question because you can kind of compare. Uh, like there are two complementary techniques of dealing with this problem of distribution shift. Um, yeah, this is like exactly. More of a so, control. so I, I guess he, yeah. Exactly, his approach was more like trying to actively model the distribution shift using some kind of important sampling technique. You know? Yeah, and then yeah. of course modification and, of that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. And here we're gonna just try to like take stability. We're gonna use stability theory is gonna be our mm -hmm. main hammer here. Um, and whether or not, yeah, it's a great question. If you should like, uh, if you can combine these two things, or if like one implies the other or something, like uh, you know, that's open. That's great. Um, open, open questions. You know, so. Good. Thank you. Cool. Um, 
All right, so let's uh, dig into a more quantitative definition that's going to allow us to basically interpolate between the Gronwall bound and something like this ISS. So that's going to be the main idea here. Um, so I'm going to call this incremental gain stability. Uh, this is a name I, we just made up like a couple of weeks ago. So it's probably not the best name, uh, but uh, we'll roll with this for now. So we'll call this incremental gain stability. And the definition is kind of technical. Uh, so I'll kind of walk us through this and maybe motivate like why this definition is so uh, tedious to state. Okay, so here we go. So we're gonna have this giant tuple psi here, which is like A, A0, A1, B0, B1, uh, uh, zeta, gamma. All right, and uh, I'll explain what all these do, but for the moment, all the A, A0, A1, B0, B1 constants are gonna be greater than one. Uh, we're gonna assume that A0 is less than A1 and B0 is less than B1, and we're gonna assume that these two, last two constants are positive. Okay, so the definition is as follows. We're gonna say that its dynamical system F is psi incremental gain stable. If for every pair of initial conditions and in every input signal and in every time horizon T, so this part is still the same, we're gonna let delta T denote the discrepancy between uh, the state uh, at time T when I initialize uh, from psi one and, and play the sequence of inputs U, difference with the state at time T if I initialize from psi two and play all zeros, so that's what delta T is gonna equal. So our definition says that when I sum from T is zero to big T of the minimum of the discrepancy to the A minimum A zero, uh, minimum with uh, discrepancy to the A maximum of A one power. So, okay, this is very uh, tedious to state and kind of weird to, to parse, but bear with me for a moment. This quantity here is gonna be upper bounded by uh, the constant zeta times norm of psi one, psi two to the A power. Okay, uh, plus gamma times sum of all the disturbances we've seen or all the inputs we've seen so far, but we're gonna need to take a maximum of these inputs uh, between the B0 and the B1 power. Okay, and the point of this is that, uh, the reason it's like so annoyingly stated is that uh, when you wanna prove quantitative rates, right? You also, well, I'll show you in a second, but basically you have dynamical systems where like different parts of the state space, they exhibit different types of behavior. So for instance, we're gonna construct a dynamical system that near the origin, it's gonna behave in a certain way and, and, and say like outside of a ball radius one, it's gonna behave in a different way. And because we kind of want like a, a rate that sort of works in all these cases, we, we kind of have all these like minimums of different be quantitative behaviors in different sections, right? Because we want this to hold for every element in the state space. And so we kind of need to essentially have several cases. And the way to sort of collapse all these cases into one equation is to like tediously write minimums and maximums everywhere. And so that's like why it's stated this way. It's a little bit unwieldy to work with. Uh, we're trying to clean this up a little bit, but this is kind of what we have at the moment. Okay, so that's a definition. And let me give you, uh, okay, so I'm first gonna state a claim and then I'll give you some examples. So. The first claim we're gonna argue, and uh, I'll probably skip the proof for this, but the first claim is that if this F tilde function is psi IGF, so before we just assumed it was delta ISS, but now we're gonna assume it's psi IGF under our new definition, then the discrepancy measure is less than a constant four uh, times you know, maximum of gamma and one to some power. Uh, importantly here, it's we actually get T to the one minus one over A uh, um, to the maximum A1. So I always get these wedges and Vs mixed up. Okay, so wedge here is uh, minimum and V is maximum. Okay, so wedge is uh, the first one and then is, is like the, this thing and then the V is the thing that looks like a V. Okay, uh, so the important thing about this bound uh, is that it actually is uh, like T is allowed to scale as a function of A and A1. So for instance, if A is one, then this is actually independent. And we'll see that's exactly the case of like exponential uh, incremental stability. And apart and uh, alternatively, you know, if A is very large, uh, then this actually kind of approaches uh, like linear and T, right? So this is it gives the point, the A1 here actually gives you a knob to interpolate between, you know, one and T and, and uh, it, with this definition. Okay, uh, so this is, this is the claim. Uh, it's just, uh, I'm gonna skip this, the proof of this claim. Uh, it's, uh, it just kind of follows by the definition. It's a little ugly, but it follows by the definitions. It's, you know, elementary 
the only thing is, I guess it's based on holders and it's effectively a consequence of holders inequality. Uh, but uh, so we'll skip this. Um, so let's just take it as faith for now, but uh, I wanna show you some examples. Um, okay, uh, sorry. Uh, the second thing is that it also implies the state is bounded, uh, also not that important for now. So uh, let, me, uh, let me show you some examples and we'll come back to the Lyapunov characterization. Uh, so we'll kind of go out of order here. Okay, so the first example <clears throat> is contraction. Uh, and I'm going to say, when we title this is contraction implies exponential IGS, and we'll see what that means. So what is contraction? So contraction is this idea from uh, uh, Slotin and Low Miller, um, which basically looks, it's a way of sort of certifying exponential incremental stability, right? And I'm going to present to you a first, a very simplified version of it, then I'll present to you a more general version of it. But the simplified version of it says that suppose there exists a positive definite matrix M that's lower and upper bounded by mu and L. Uh, and a constant row in zero one, such that the following two conditions hold. Uh, okay, so uh, contraction is actually the first condition and the second condition is the Lipschitz condition on U. So the contraction condition is this. It says that F of X is zero. So this is the autonomous dynamics minus F at Y is zero, evaluated in the M norm uh, the weighted M norm. So this is basically square root of uh, this thing transpose M, this thing, uh, is less than rho times X minus Y evaluated in the M norm for all X, Y in the state space. Okay, so it basically says that if I look at the M norm, the function F is a contraction in that norm. That's why it's called contraction. Okay, so that's what the simplified condition of contraction is. Uh, the second condition that we'll sort of need uh, is to kind of relate the input u to the autonomous dynamics. And we're just going to require that uh, if I fix x, f of x u minus f of x zero is Lipschitz in, uh, is, is Lipschitz for all u, okay? Uh, and so this first condition is, it, you may have seen contraction before stated differentially. And so the first condition is equivalent to the following condition that says that, if so if, let's suppose that F is differentiable, then uh, DF DX, the Jacobian here, transpose M times DF DX is semi-definite less than rho squared M. Okay, so this is often what you uh, <clears throat> people refer to when they say contraction, is this, this uh, differential uh, inequality. Okay, uh, you, you, may, <clears throat> you may recognize this as basically saying that uh, like the uh, the Jacobian linearization uh, at X is a, is a linear system, right? And that linear system is Lyapunov stable. That's what this thing is saying right here. This is the discrete time Lyapunov stability condition. Okay, and so the claim is that if we have these conditions, then F is psi IGS with these constants. And so uh, remember, this was a, a0, a1, b0, b1, and this was the beta, and this was gamma, right? And so what it says is that all the a, a0, a1s, b0, b1s are all one, and the only two constants that actually contribute anything interesting is the gain. And so equivalently, what it says is that if I sum the discrepancies from time zero to t, it's less than L over one minus rho times mu times the difference between the initial conditions plus the Lipschitz constant LU over one minus rho times mu times the sum of all the deviation of all the inputs I put in, right? So there's no minimums or maximums here because all of them collapse away because all these constants are one. This is like the cleanest setting. Okay, so this is like the best case we can hope for for IGS. And the proof of this uh, uh, is, uh, is going to be based on this Lyapunov characterization. So I'm going to skip this for now. I'm sorry I'm going out of order, but I want to give you another example that is less trivial than exponential. Then I'll go to the Lyapunov condition, and then we'll go back to the proofs of these things because we will use the Lyapunov condition to do the proof. Okay. Um, so the more general version of contraction is where the metric is actually allowed to depend on the state. Okay. Uh, and in particular, this is easier to state in its differential form. It basically says that df dx evaluate x transpose m of x times df dx evaluate x is semi-definite less than rho squared times m of x for all x. Okay, so it turns out that the same IGS condition applies with this more general condition, 
the proof is much more technical because you have to look at Riemannian energies and not just L2 norms, but it's really the same idea. So basically this condition implies IGS, uh, exponential IGS, this, this more general contraction condition. So let me give you some uh, examples of contracting systems because this differential inequality is maybe uh, a little bit like arbitrary. Okay, so the first condition, uh, sorry, the first example is uh, going to be a, a piecewise linear system. So I have partitioned the state space into K pieces, uh, C1 to CK. And for each of those pieces, I associate a linear, uh, a, a matrix AI. Uh, and uh, you know, the way I'm gonna choose that is basically I'm gonna choose which version of which part of the state space I live in and pick out that AI. And that's gonna hit the X, okay? And then the, what I'm gonna do with the input is I'm just gonna modulate that or I'm gonna hit it with a bounded arbitrary like function B of X. Now, if <clears throat> the AIs are stable, with a common quadratic Lyapunov function P. Okay, in general, uh, you don't have a qu common quadratic Lyapunov function, but sometimes you do. And what contraction is a case where you do have it, right? So if you do have this common quadratic Lyapunov function uh, and B is bounded, then you actually have a contracting system and lo and behold, that common quadratic Lyapunov function is the metric. Okay, so that's kind of like the first simplest example. But let me give you a more interesting example where everything is truly nonlinear. Uh, so we can have the scalar system where f of x u is equal to log one plus x squared plus u. Okay, so this is some like weird scalar system. Importantly, the metric here is state dependent. So the metric is m of x is equal to two times uh, two over one plus e to the minus absolute value x. Okay, it's not obvious that this is true, but if you just evaluate the, the derivatives and then you plug this in and then you ask Mathematica, is this equation true? Uh, Mathematica will say yes. So uh, this is an example of, uh, of, of a truly nonlinear system with a nonlinear state-dependent metric. Okay, the last example I like a lot. Uh, the last, especially, you, you will like this too if you come, come from optimization background. The, the last example says, if I have a function V uh, and I look at the potential or the gradient of V, <clears throat> if that function is strongly convex, so basically, if I'm running gradient descent on a strongly convex function, and strongly convex means that the Hessian uh, is lower bounded by mu, and if also the Hessian is also uniformly upper bounded, and if my step size is one over L, which is the step size that you get from gradient descent, then this system here is actually contracting. Uh, and it's contracting in the identity metric. So basically, contraction is like, one way you can think of like how to prove stability for gradient descent on strongly convex functions. Uh, There's a very nice paper by Patrick Wensing and uh, John Jacques Fotin called Beyond Convexity, where they kind of generalize if you're interested in, in this viewpoint, they go over this viewpoint and they actually generalize this to like geodesically convex uh, functions. Uh, and, but anyway, those are the side. So these are some examples of contracting systems. Okay. so. Now let's move beyond exponential IGS and look at a more nuanced or polynomial type of IGS. So I'm gonna call this a tunable psi IGS system. And the following is the claim. Uh, so suppose I look at the scalar dynamics f of x u equals x minus eta x times uh, absolute value of x to the p over one plus absolute value of x to the p. Okay, so I have this, uh, this system here, and then I add eta times u to make it a uh, controlled affine system. Okay, the claim is as follows. I allow p to live in zero infinity, and my step size needs to be less than four over five plus p. If these two conditions hold, then f is actually incrementally stable, but the constants are, are interesting here. So basically, a, a and a zero are one, but a one is one plus p, B and B zero one, and the gains actually are a function of P as well. So uh, if we look at what the definition says, it says that the minimum of the distance of the, the, the deviations uh, with no power comma, the deviation to the one plus P power is less than uh, two to the two plus P over eta times the, the initial condition deviation uh, plus two to the two times, uh, two to the two plus P uh, times sum of all these inputs. Okay, so this is a case where the minimums are actually necessary, right? Like basically the behavior of the system away when X is greater than one looks, you know, roughly like a linear system. But when X is uh, uh, very small, 
then basically you actually get a system that looks something like uh, x minus x to the one plus p, right? And that behaves very, very differently from a linear system, right? That's the rates sort of slow down as p goes to infinity. And that's kind of why uh, all these conditions get worse as p goes to infinity, because the, everything sort of slows down. But the point is here, you have a, a, a knob that you can tune to get like all the rates that you want. Okay. Um, okay, so the proof idea is to basically show an, an uh, Lyapunov function. So let's actually go back and uh, talk about how to verify incremental gain stability, right? And much like stability theory is verified with Lyapunov functions, incremental gain stability can also be verified with an incremental Lyapunov function. So the incremental Lyapunov function is a function that has the following properties. So first of all, we're going to upper and lower bound it by it's going to be major, minorized and majorized by a constant times the difference between x and y. So a, an incremental Lyapunov function takes two arguments, an x and a y. And these are both arguments that live in the state space. So, so a regular Lyapunov function only takes one argument, right? But these actually need to compare trajectories, so they take two arguments, right? And they're minorized and majorized by the difference of the, 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 um, the two points, the two arguments, raised to a power a, OK? And the Lyapunov inequality is basically, uh, so we're in discrete time. So this first term is essentially like the, the derivative or the Lie derivative, right? It's, you know, V of F minus V, but importantly, the F evaluates on both of the X and Y. So it's V of X, F, X, U, comma, V of Y zero, right? Uh, minus V of X, Y. So this is like the Lie derivative condition here. And what we require is that it's less than negative uh, mass frac A times minimum of the deviation of X minus Y to the A zero power, uh, comma, the minimum of the, devi uh, the, the deviation to the A one power. So it needs to be less than, you know, this is allowing basically to have two regimes, right? In one regime, uh, you know, it needs to sort of be uh, less than one of these powers and the other regime it needs to be less than the other power. And then plus mass frac D times the maximum of the power of U uh, and, and we'll take the either B0 or B1, okay? So this is the Lyapunov condition you need to verify in order to get IGS. If the claim is that if this holds, <coughs> if both these conditions hold, then you get IGS with these constants here. Okay, so is there any question about like what this formula here is saying? Okay, so the proof of this is uh, actually uh, quite simple. Basically, we're going to look at two dynamics. We're basically going to do exactly uh, these type of uh, proofs that we did before, where we look at one dynamical system uh, driven by ut, and the other dynamic, and we'll call it x, and the other dynamical system is driven by no inputs, and we'll call that y. Okay, and what we do is that we define v of t to be v of x t y t. And so we have basically by the Lyapunov inequality, we immediately have a recurrence that says v of t plus one is less than v of t minus um, the Lyapunov inequality, right? Minus a times the minimum here plus b times the maximum here. Okay, so that's like, this is for free by assumption. <laughs> and so what we do then is we basically you know, as in every discretely open up proof, we then unroll this recursion. <clears throat> and when we unroll the recursion, we get something like v, v of big T plus sum of all these minimum terms here, right? So is less than V is zero plus the, 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 the input, right? And so the only thing that's left to do is then basically kind of remove these annoying V T and V zero here. And we do that by just using our upper and lower bounds assumptions on V. So, that's exactly what we do. So here we, we upper bound V zero by using the upper bound, the majorization condition. And that's why we get these initial conditions that pop out. And then we'll lower bound um, VT by using the uh, minorization condition. And it's a little bit annoying because uh, you, know, you have to compare this guy here with these two powers. So you can say it's less than the minimum of these three powers, but then you can prove a simple lemma that says when you minimize 
you know, a bunch of scalars to the A to a bunch of powers, it's sufficient to look at the maximum and the minimum of those powers. Uh, so that's exactly what this does. Um, and that's the entire proof. So this is a very constructive, simple condition to check if you're IGS. Right, so that's us. <clears throat> So are there any questions about uh, this, uh, this uh, proof? Okay, so once we have this Lyapunov characterization, we can go back to these proofs where I sort of claim that the system is IGS and we can actually just verify the Lyapunov condition. So for contraction, we, we set the Lyapunov function to be X minus Y to the uh, in, evaluated in the M norm. Uh, and then, then we basically just use triangle inequality and the contraction assumption, uh, and then that basically verifies the Lyapunov condition. So this one is actually very easy. This is just triangle inequality. Okay. Um, the second one is, uh, as you can imagine, this one is non-trivial. This one is very tedious. Uh, you can see it in our paper, but I won't go through it. Um, but it's it's elementary. You just have to like go through all the cases, but it's very tedious. Uh, so I won't go through it but it's, you, you just show it's a Lyapunov function. Okay, so now we can go back and actually now, okay, with these tools in mind, we can now actually analyze uh, uh, behavior cloning. Uh, we can actually start to anim analyze imitation learning. We'll start with behavior cloning. So let's now use this toolkit that we developed to analyze what I will call stability constrained behavior cloning. Um, so let's get to this. Um, so recall the set of a behavior cloning. We have these M expert trajectories uh, that are rolled out by um, drawing initial conditions randomly ID from D and, and rolling them out with the expert uh, uh, traject uh, policy. So standard behavior cloning just does imitation learning by doing supervised learning with these uh, and, and minimizing the imitation loss here. Uh, but we're gonna add a new constraint here. So here we argument over pi in the policy class pi. We're now we're gonna argument over pi in the policy class pi psi, where pi psi is the set of policies that live in this policy class and such that when you close a loop, uh, you are psi IGS. Okay, so you might ask a question like, how are we gonna optimize over this thing? This is like hard, right? Uh, we're gonna ignore that question for now. Uh, we're just going to write mathematically what we wanna solve. We're gonna analyze this like idealized optimization problem and then I'll talk about how one might actually do this optimization. So for now, it's a, this is just a, you know, a, a, it's a well-defined mathematical optimization problem. Uh, let's assume we can solve it and then we'll see what happens. Okay. So we're gonna optimize basically over the set of closed, where all the set of policies where when we close the loop, we are IGS. So uh, in order to do this, you, you know, if you wanted to actually implement this, you would need to know F and G. So in the setting of behavior cloning, I'm assuming that you actually know the dynamics. It's the expert that is hard, right? And I think that's a, a lot of cases, you know, in robotics, say, you know, you can kind of write down the Euler-Lagrange equations for dynamics, but coming up with an expert is, is maybe the tricky part. So I think this is not the unreasonable assumption to assume you know the dynamics. So let's roll with it for now. Okay, so what are we gonna need to assume for this analysis? Um, probably unsurprising at this point, we're gonna need some Lipschitz and boundedness assumptions, uh, but let's let's get to them. So the first uh, assumption is we're gonna assume that the policy class preserves the fixed point. So this one is very benign. It just says that, uh, you know, if I'm at the origin, my policy is not stupid and it, it keeps me at the origin. Okay, so this one is basically for free. Uh, the second thing we're gonna assume is that uh, we have realizability and stability. So we're gonna assume that the expert pi star uh, A lives in this policy class we're gonna optimize over and B also induces a closed loop that is psi uh, IGS. Now, the first assumption is not that unreasonable because you can use a very rich policy class. You know, you can say to use a policy class, it's like, you know, somewhat universal. And so, you know, uh, most ex reasonable experts that are say, you know, continuous and, uh, you know, not completely degenerate would live in this policy class. The second condition is, is, is where you kind of need to take a leap of faith. You need to assume that your expert um, is actually doing a good job of stabilizing the system at some rate, right? Uh, again, if your expert is actually solving the task, maybe not the most unrealistic assumption because you know, uh, ideally an expert that solves a task is not doing it in a wildly unstable way. Um, so we're just gonna make that assumption for now. 
And the final assumption is the usual, like, okay, we're going to assume that the policy deviation is L delta Lipschitz. Uh, sure. And uh, for all policies, uh, uh, oops, this is a, uh, yeah, okay, sorry. So for we're assuming that for every policy, pair of policies in the policy class, the policy deviation is L delta Lipschitz. And we're also assuming that the G matrix is uniformly upper bounded. Um, that's just a kind of an annoying assumption that we need. Uh, but, but okay, so we have these two, we have these three assumptions here. Okay, so now we can basically put all these tools together and start to make some progress. So we'll start with basically the generalization error of behavior cloning, right? So as I said before, that's the expectation over uh, initial conditions drawn from this distribution of the uh, imitation loss where I use the behavior clone policy to drive the trajectories, right? So this is L of pi BC, uh, pi BC compared to pi star. By our Lipschitz assumption, we can upper bound this by the expected, by L delta times the expected value of the sum of this discrepancies. Uh, some of these, uh, these um, uh, like the discrepancy between the trajectory, and we already gave a notation for that. So basically the, the inequality is that the generalization error is less than L delta times the discrepancy between uh, behavior cloning uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, pi star. Yes, okay, good, uh, cool. And so now by the assumption that uh, behavior cloning, the, the behavior cloning policy is actually psi IGS, then we can use IGS where we show that the discrepancy is upper bounded by the imitation loss and Basically, that inequality that I showed you above essentially says that, you know, discrepancy here is upper bounded by some function of t that will go to zero as a1 goes, uh, is, goes to one, uh, times b0 over a1 times the imitation loss. And importantly, this imitation loss is actually using pi star as a data generating distribution, right? So we started with this imitation loss that used pi behavior cloning to generate the data, but we use this IGS to convert it and upper bound this quantity here by the um, uh, imitation loss that generates data from pi star, which is what we're actually minimizing and have control over. Right, and it, so it's basically, it's the stability property that allows us to convert this distribution here to this distribution here. So this is effectively how we handle distribution shift. So I kind of want us to like stare at this for a moment because this is like the crux of the argument here. Really, we, we took the generalization error we cared about, we related it to the discrepancy between the trajectories, and then we used the stability to bound that by the imitation loss under the, uh, the, the expert. So yeah, that's, that's, that's what we did. Okay, cool. So now all that remains now is we just need to bound this quantity here, but we can now use the tools we learned this morning from supervised learning to get a handle on this quantity, right? So we're just gonna use uniform convergence to bound this quantity, and then we chain all these inequalities together and we have a bound on the generalization error behavior coding. Okay, so let's work through the uh, uniform convergence argument. Um, okay, so in stability constraint DC, we minimize this function, this empirical risk, so again, we're doing empirical risk minimization. And because we did empirical risk minimization, we know that the empirical loss is you know, good, but we want to know now what do we, can we say about the general, the, the true loss, right? The, when you take expectation over the population. Um, and as before, the problem is because pi BC is a function of uh, psi one to psi M, uh, the expectation, uh, do not equal, like, because it's, you know, it's dependent on the data, it's not an unbiased, the, the empirical risk is no longer an unbiased estimate of the true risk. And so we can't just use the standard Huxley inequality, we have to turn to uniform conversion. So we basically need a uniform law that says that uh, for every policy in the policy class, the empirical loss of that policy uh, is uh, the deviation between the empirical loss and the true loss of that policy uh, is sort of uniformly controlled. So, so that's what this expression here is saying. And that's exactly the tools that we developed this morning. Um, so let's work through that again. Uh, so basically, 
in order to apply these tools. And, and, and so this, the, okay, so in this morning, uh, Nick talked about like slow rates and fast rates. So the slow rate is sort of the one over square root M rate. The fast rate is like the one over M rate. In the learning stability certificates, I used Natty Shrebro's result that it basically did uniform convergence of fast rates. Here, we're gonna actually use the more elementary one where we go back to these slow rates. Uh, and the reason we're gonna do this uh, will, will be because we're not necessarily going to have zero empirical risk uh, when we analyze more complicated versions of, uh, of imitation learning. So for behavior cloning, we will actually, because of our realizability assumption, get zero empirical risk, but we're not going to take advantage of that right now because uh, um, I just want the, I just, I want us to develop one tool for uniform convergence for this lecture. But in principle, because for behavior cloning, we do get zero empirical risk, you can actually use Natty Shrebro's result in place of what I'm going to show you here and actually get a stronger rate of convergence. Uh, so, so that's an aside, if that made sense. Okay, but anyways, so we're going to use the weaker version that gives you these slow rates, but in order to do that, it's very similar, right? You're going to need to A, derive a uniform bound, and B, derive a bound on the Rademacher complexity, right? And so it's essentially the same game that we played over and over again, where we just need to kind of use stability theory to bound the Rademacher complexity. And our main tool is going to be showing everything is Lipschitz, and then we're going to use Dudley's inequality, and that's going to be how we get our bound. Uh, so yeah, is there any question uh, before we jump into this? Okay. So uh, the unit, so right, there's two pieces. We need to get a uniform bound on a loss, and we also need to control the Rademacher complexity. Uh, the uniform bound of loss um, uh, is, uh, I'm going to skip this part because it's very simple. You just use the fact that if you have an incrementally gain stable policy, it gives you boundedness of state and hence the loss is going to be bounded like trivially. All right, so we're going to skip this one. The more interesting one is the raw marker complexity. So again, I'm going to fix the policy class pi uh, in order to uh, obtain concrete bounds. So we're going to again use this kind of policy class where it's, you know, this parametric function in Q parameters here, the 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 weights of the the norm of the weights of the parameters are bounded, and uh, and it's like differentiable, twice differentiable kind of thing here. So we're going to use this simpler similar thing we did in the first part of the talk. Uh, here I define this ugly looking quantity to basically uh, it'll show up in analysis. The detail of this this L delta squared pi is basically just controlling allows us to control the Lipschitz constant of this quantity here. Um, and the claim is that the Rademacher complexity of this particular policy class is upper bounded by uh, some terms times t to the 1 minus 1 over alpha 1 times square root k over m. Right. So here we really see that the stability theory is really playing a role in the Rademacher complexity because this A1 constant is coming directly from our definition of, of IGS. And so is this one right here. So really we see that like as you know as we vary a1 we are directly affecting the 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 Rademacher complexity of of this loss All right so this is kind of really cool because it shows there's a direct interplay between stability and uniform convergence okay um actually we're gonna uh i i think i i realize we uh, are a little bit over the hour so i'm gonna state this claim and then we'll take a a, a break here like a five minute break uh, and uh, and then we'll come back and like, we'll go through this proof. But yeah, I'm just gonna pause here uh, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll take a short break now. We're wanting to bound the Rademacher complexity of that policy class. Uh, we're, I'm claiming that it's uh, scales like T to the one minus uh, one over A one times the square root of K or Q over M where Q is the number of parameters. Um, and so, yeah, let's kind of dig in to see uh, how we might do this and why, why the stability kind of comes into play here. Uh, okay, so again, as I said before, the main idea is to use Dudley's inequality. Uh, there's a, the, the reason we define that ugly looking L delta square constant is because we can use Taylor's theorem to actually show the following inequality, which says that if I have a state X and theta one and theta two, if I look at pi of x theta one minus pi of x theta two, I can upper bound it by that Lipschitz constant, this L delta squared times x, the norm of x times theta one minus theta two. So basically allows me to essentially scale the Lipschitz constant with the size of x. And this is actually gonna be kind of important. This is how we're gonna take advantage of stability, right? 
Uh, so let's see how that works, right? And so the, the loss we need to bound are basically, we have one, uh, we have one distribution D, pi D that generates a data that we assume to be IGS. And then we have one distribution pi one uh, that's gonna vary uh, one distribution pi two, and then we fix the goal policy uh, uh, pi G. Sorry, so I might have not actually, let me kind of give you some context. I, don't, I think I kind of like went too fast over this. Like why, where are these goal policies coming from? Um, let's see, and where I set up um, uh, uniform convergence. Let's see, where is this? Yeah, okay, right here. So the uniform convergence we're gonna prove is we're going to basically fix a data generating distribution pi D that's stable, IGS, and we're gonna fix a goal policy pi G as uh, in pi. So uh, you can think of this as like uh, pi star. You can think of both of these actually being pi star for this case. But when we later, when we, if, I don't know if we'll actually have time to get to this, but uh, well, we should. Um, when we analyze, or when we at least kind of sketch how you might analyze more complicated versions of behavior of, of imitation learning that work through multiple epochs, we're actually gonna need to like change these up a little bit. So that's why I proved this law in a more general form. Uh, but anyways, what this is saying, if I fix a data generating distribution pi D and a target distribution or goal, dist uh, sorry, data generating policy pi D, a target policy pi G, uh, I'm going to fix these guys and I'm going to vary the first argument in the loss, right? I'm gonna soup over pi and pi of the first argument here. So you can see here, I should have color coded this one, but this is what's being uniformly varied over, right? And so that's why uh, in our proofs, we're gonna be able to fix pi D and pi G arbitrarily. And the only and the only thing we're gonna vary is going to be this first argument, pi one and pi two here, right? Okay, so that's, uh, that's the context. All right, sorry about that, um, good. So now going back to uh, the bound on the Rademacher complexity, uh, right. So as I said before, we fix pi D and pi G. And so the only thing we're varying is pi one, pi two. We're gonna give them parameters theta one and theta two. And so we now we look at the absolute value between these two losses uh, by reverse triangle inequality. That's the, the, the sum of the difference between the policy uh, deviations, pi one, pi G and pi two, pi G. Uh, but by the definition of the policy deviation, it has this nice property that when I fix pi g in the second argument and then take the difference, I can basically, I make the pi g go away. And it's basically the deviations between pi one and pi two, right? And so basically this is equal to the sum of the deviation between pi one and pi two times uh, the, the state at time t of the data generating distribution. Now, because we assume that, remember pi uh, delta of pi is G times pi one minus pi two, right? So because we assume that G is uniformly bounded, we can basically pull the G out and that's why we get a BG here. And then we have exactly the sum of the difference between the policies evaluated along the same state of the data generating distribution, but the two parameters here vary. Uh, and that's exactly the setting of this inequality that I claimed up here, right? And so once we're in this setting, we can now plug in this inequality up here. Uh, and then that basically allows us to sum over all the states we've seen so far. So in fact, this X here now becomes this uh, phi of T pi D. And that's why it's really important for us to actually be able to uh, have a bound that depends on X. Because if this was not here, right? If we didn't have these pi, this X here, basically we would immediately hit T here, right? We basically like this would be upper bounded by L delta uh, uh, theta one, theta two, and then we would sum it up T times and we would immediately have a T here. But because we allow ourselves to have a Lipschitz constant that actually depends on X, we can now look at the sum over the data drain distribution and use our IGS condition to actually bound the sum here by T to the one minus one over A one, right? And so that's kind of, uh, that's, that's the, the setup here. So we basically proved that this policy, this, this losses are Lipschitz and the policy parameters with this Lipschitz constant down here. Okay. And once you prove that the policies are Lipschitz in, in this Euclidean sense, then, then you're pretty much done because you just apply Dudley's inequality and cover over these Euclidean uh, balls. Uh, but this is kind of the main argument, the crux of the main argument here. So uh, 
is this is this clear here? All right. So as I mentioned before, right. So once we have that uh, Lipschitz inequality, then then now we can use the standard machinery, right? We basically have that Dudley tells us we need to integrate over the covering number of the LQ ball. Uh, we know that the covering number is bounded by one plus two over epsilon to the Q. So we just do this. And then that's why we end up with the square root Q over M factor. Uh, yeah, so, so that's pretty much it. So that's the whole proof there. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so basically what we could do now is just combine and chain all those inequalities I showed you above. And we get this final looking, uh, we get this final expression for the generalization error of behavior cloning. Uh, uh, you know, there's some ugly constants in front, but importantly, the the, two, the last two terms is what I uh, want to focus on. Um, it's really just like this p, uh, this p thing here, and then the q over m to some power, right? So the proof of this is exactly as we did before. I'm going to actually just skip this because it's just a uniform convergence and the basic inequality. So okay, uh, yeah, good. All right, it's just a, a lot of algebra stitching the inequalities together. So only focusing on t, q, and m, we have that the error of behavior cloning is t to the 1 minus 1 over a1 times 1 plus b0 over a1 times q over m to the b0 over 2a1. So that's an ugly looking expression. But if we focus on the contraction case, we can set all these a, b constants to 1, in which case it's actually a very clean expression. It says that the error of behavior cloning is a constant here uh, times q over m square root. Okay, so it looks very much like a supervised learning rate. So basically this says like, yeah, behavior cloning, I learn at the same rate as supervised learning, where I, uh, except for maybe I pick up some extra constants depending on the Lipschitz and the stability and, and like the gains, uh, but um, it really is just like supervised learning, right? Supervised learning the typical rate is like square root number of parameters over number of data points, right? And so if I set this equal to epsilon, it tells me I need roughly M is Q over epsilon squares trajectories to guarantee uh, with high probability that the generalization error is bounded by epsilon, right? So this is a very standard kind of rate that you expect in supervised learning. Now, where things get interesting is now for this tunable IGS system I showed you before, uh, B0 is one, but A1 is actually one plus P and P is allowed to vary from zero to infinity. Oh, sorry, uh, zero to infinity, this is a typo, it should be zero to infinity. Okay, which uh, then, so I, then now I actually get a rate where the T the horizon length plays a more interesting role, where it's t to the one minus one over one plus p squared, okay? And also the p also plays a role in, in, in here, up, up, up here where the, for the q over m. So uh, if I set this equal to epsilon and I solve for epsilon, if I solve m in terms of, I solve for m, then basically I get m greater than q times t to the p times p plus two over one plus p over epsilon to the two times one plus p. So P is zero, this exactly reduces to the um, contraction rate. Uh, whereas when P goes off to infinity, then this rate kind of degrades very poorly, right? And in particular, if P lives between zero and 0.618, then you actually only need sublinear number, uh, sublinear trajectories, right? This is actually less than P. Uh, but when P is greater than 0.618, then this actually becomes greater than P, right? And so what this identifies is that there's actually a, a, a set of systems for where you can actually get away, uh, a, a set of systems that are not exponentially stable for where you can actually get away with sublinear number of trajectories, uh, sublinear and horizon length number of trajectories uh, when doing imitation learning, uh, which is pretty cool. Like I, this is the first type of result uh, where you actually are able to, to make some sort of delineation in, in this um, without assuming like strong convexity of losses and stuff like that. So. Yeah, uh, any questions here? Do you have um, a particular example or setting where, where this shows up that, that you know or that you can... So for this last remark regarding the, the P setting. Mm -hmm. You're asking like, uh, is there a practical system or like a real system where we can compute these IGS rates. Uh, no, just, no, maybe just for intuition that you say, ah, oh, this is something, but probably not, but maybe. Well, so remember, I did give you a family of systems where 
the IGS rate is exactly one plus P, right? It was that, uh, it was that like X minus X to the X absolute, uh, it, there was some ex the formula, right? Yeah. So there was a scalar system where we exactly got this, uh, this type of, of stability. Um, I don't know if there's a, like, I, I haven't constructed another system that's uh, maybe more realistic that has this property uh, that I don't know, uh, but we at least do have one example. Okay. Um, and experimentally, it actually, I will show you uh, before we end that experimentally, like uh, if you just run the system, it actually does take more trajectories. Like the worst, the, the higher you jack up P, the worse the, the, the worse the performance that the imitation learning actually exhibits. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Like, it seems like it actually like does matter in practice, uh, the stability stuff. Right, 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 meaning that these are all upper bounds, right? So it, it, we don't have lower bounds. Uh, maybe that's actually what you were asking if there was like a lower bound uh, that said like, this is actually somewhat necessary. We don't have any lower bounds yet. And so it, it could be the case in theory that like none of this actually matters and these are just all bad analyses. Uh, but we show experimentally that, uh, uh, you know, it actually does get worse as P goes to uh, infinity. Okay, uh, so now um, we have about half an hour left. Uh, and so I'm gonna spend, a, I'm just gonna talk like at a high level about the epoch-based algorithms. I'll maybe sketch out how one might analyze them and then I wanna go to the experiments uh, because I think they, it'll be a good place to end. Uh, yeah, so let's just talk about uh, epoch-based algorithms. So if you're familiar with the literature on behavior cloning or, or sorry, imitation learning, you'll know that people always say, don't do behavior cloning, it's really bad. you know. It has compounding errors in practice. You've got to do something like dagger, right? And so there are actually two more practical algorithms developed uh, by Stephane Ross in the uh, early 2010s. One of them is called Smile, and the one that follows up on that is called Dagger or uh, Data Set Aggregation, something like that. Uh, and these are very popular algorithms in reinforcement learning. Uh, like when you're doing imitation learning, like gold standard is pretty much Dagger uh, in an interactive setting. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk about these. Two. I'm going to basically tell you what these two algorithms are, uh, and then I will talk about how you will modify them to do analysis with stability. I'll show you what the results are, uh, skipping the proofs, and then we'll look at some experiments. Um, okay. So the first algorithm is the Smile. Uh, it's an epoch-based algorithm, so it works as follows. So you fix a number of epochs that you're, you're ahead of time, uh, and you fix a mixing weight alpha in zero one. So what you do is you start with the expert policy. So you set pi zero to be the expert. And for each epoch, you collect rollouts with pi k. Uh, and then we will update pi k. Uh, so for now, OK, so we're going to do this inductively. So we we, we're going to collect rollouts with pi k. And then what we're going to do is we're going to basically minimize uh, the empirical loss. Right? We're going we're gonna to minimize the imitation loss under pi k. Right, so we're going to collect rollouts, and we're going to find a policy pi hat k that minimizes imitation loss uh, under pi k. And so what this means, right, in, in particular, if pi k is not the expert, uh, then in order to minimize the imitation loss, we actually need to have the expert label each one of these states, right? So in each state, the expert has to say, okay, you know, this is what you did, but this is what I would have done, right? And this is what I mean by the interactive setting. So these uh, these algorithms only work in the interactive setting where you can have an expert that can like counter, like basically like after the fact say, okay, I would have done this, right? Um, so that's captured in this, this notation of the loss function. Um, the, the question of how do you do imitation learning from a bag of data where you're not allowed to query the expert after the data has been handed to you, uh, it's like a question of like offline imitation learning. I still think it's actually pretty much open. I mean, uh, it seems like maybe Bo talked a little bit about it uh, earlier. Um, uh, yesterday, but I think it's still uh, uh, not completely resolved yet. Um, so it's, it's very much open. Uh, so we're going to focus on the interactive setting. Okay, so the what you do now is after you generate pi hat of k, you then update the policy at the next epoch to be pi of k plus one is a weighted combination or a convex combination 
one minus alpha times the previous policy plus alpha times the policy you learned. Okay, so you're like slowly mixing in these policies and taking small steps away from the expert, right? And at the very end, you do this one more time. So you take pi e minus one and you roll out and you, you imitate pi e minus one. And then you do this final step where you remove the expert. And it turns out that if you just unroll this recursion, right, the expert basically has a contribution of one minus alpha to the e power pi star. So what you do then is you basically mix in this last policy, subtract out the expert, and then renormalize. So one over one minus one minus alpha to the e, right? And that basically gives you a policy that um, is expert free. Uh, and it's basically a weighted combinations of all these pi hats that you learned uh, previously. And in particular, it shows that at epoch e, the contribution of the experts exponentially, you know, it's like one minus alpha to the e. So the experts contribution is like it decays exponentially over time. Uh, so this is the SMILE algorithm. This is due to uh, uh, Stephane Ross um, and uh, Drew Bagnell. Um, are there any questions about this algorithm? OK. Um, so the dagger algorithm is very similar. It also works in epochs, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's different in, in its own ways. Uh, so the dagger algorithm basically works as follows. You first set pi hat of 0 to be any policy. It really doesn't matter what you set here. So for every epoch, you're going to play, uh, you're going to set pi k, your data generating a policy at time k, or epoch k, to be alpha to the k times the expert, uh, plus 1 minus alpha to the k uh, times uh, uh, the pi hat of k. Right. And then what you do then is you basically roll out this policy, pi hat of, of uh, pi k, right? And then you then ask that not only on the current rollout you've seen so far, but uh, across all the history of all the um, data you've seen, you want to do a good job of imitating the expert across all that history. So that's why this algorithm is called data set aggregation, because you actually aggregate all the previous uh, episodes or rollouts that you saw, and you, you still ask that you do a good job of, of, of imitating the expert under those distributions. Okay. Uh, and so that's what pi hat k plus one is going to be. You're going to basically minimize the aggregates uh, of the imitation loss along all the trajectories you've seen so far, not just the last epoch. Um, and then at the very end, you return quote unquote the best uh, policy out of uh, pi one, uh, pi hat one to pi hat e. In practice, you can just return the last one. That seems to work pretty well in our experiments. Uh, but in, in in principle, you actually have to select the best out of these. Um, and so dagger. Uh, the way you analyze dagger is actually through a, an online optimization reduction. Uh, if you're familiar with that kind of thing, if you're not, basically it relies on convexity of the loss function uh, with respect to, like you would just essentially, if I write this thing out here, I actually require that L of pi is, is convex in like the parameters of pi. Uh, and if you don't have that, their analysis doesn't actually go through. It, it really relies on this like convexity so that you can use this uh, like follow leader type uh, reduction. Um, so uh, that's dagger. Uh, we're going to analyze, or I'm going to basically tell you how you can use our machinery to analyze smile. Uh, dagger is because of the convexity problem. Uh, dagger is actually still, I'm still not quite sure how to analyze that yet. Uh, I have some ideas, but nothing quite works yet. Uh, so, but we can analyze smile at least. Uh, but we need to make a new few modifications, and unsurprisingly, we need to constrain the learned policies to be I, to be IGS stable. And furthermore, we're actually going to constrain the policies to not change too much from epoch to epoch. So we're going to basically add in a trust region constraint at every epoch. Um, yeah. So it's, it's interesting because if you know from like online convex optimization, when you're doing something like follow the leader, uh, follow the regularized leader you implicitly actually obtain something like a trust region constraint. Your policies don't deviate too much. You get that for free. Uh, but because we are actually doing non-convex stuff here, these can all be possibly non-convex problems. We actually have to enforce this like trust region kind of thing explicitly ourselves, uh, right? Like we don't have strong convexity to rely on to implicitly give us a trust region. Okay, 
And we're going to call these modifications a C mile for a constrained smile, right? And so let me give you the algorithm, how we're going to modify smile. So the modification is first to the input. We're going to take in these trust region weights, CK. Uh, the algorithm then kind of remains the same, except we, you know, we're going to collect these rollouts and we're going to subject the mixed policy at the next epoch to be IGS. So we ask that one minus alpha pi k plus alpha times the learned policy is stable, okay? And then we're also going to ask that uh, pi doesn't deviate too much from pi of k, uh, and the deviation is going to be measured in this imitation loss sense, and the deviation is going to be upper bounded by c of k, okay? Uh, right. We're going to mix the policies in the same way as we did before. And then the very last time we're gonna do the same thing where we have to basically remove the expert. We're gonna ask that once we remove the expert, we remain IGS. And we're also gonna ask that we stay, in, uh, we stay within this trust region. Uh, so it may not be obvious that each one of these problems maintains recursive feasibility. Uh, that's something that we actually have to prove, uh, but it, it is true. Uh, if you make the realizability assumption, it is true. Um, so that this is a well-defined uh, thing, right? But, but in order to really leverage our IGS machinery, we did have to add quite a few non-trivial constraints, right? And again, these are hard optimization problems to solve. In fact, it's pretty much not possible to solve these in general. Uh, you can approximate them. You can approximate these IGS constraints by enforcing the Lyapunov condition along trajectories, but it's very rare that you're gonna be able to solve it along this entire state space. But in practice, uh, it turns out that you actually like can get away with not having these IGS constraints. Um, they're kind of really more of a, of an analysis tool. Okay, are there any questions on the modification of, of smile that we call C mile? Cool. Uh, okay, so. Um, yeah, let me uh, show you the basic inequality and then I'll show you the result and then we'll turn to some experiments and then, uh, we'll, then we'll conclude. So the, the way we're gonna analyze CMILE is, is pretty similar to actually how we analyze behavior cloning, uh, but we're gonna basically like kind of do this inductively and we're gonna basically bound the generalization error at the epoch K plus one by the generalization error of the epoch at K, right? And then, then we'll like sum all these bounds up and then we'll get a final generalization error bound. And the way we do that is we kind of, we use this basic algebraic identity, which says that the policy deviation between pi k plus one and pi star, uh, when you just kind of expand it out, is equal to one minus alpha times the policy deviation of pi k and pi star, plus alpha times the policy deviation of pi hat k and pi star. Okay. And so when you, if you take this uh, basic uh, algebraic identity, you can then plug in, you can say, okay, what is the generalization error at epoch k plus one? Okay, this is definition, right? Then you just kind of plug this thing in uh, uh, here, and then you triangle inequality, and then you get three terms. You basically get one minus alpha times the generalization error at uh, epoch k. So that's good. So inductively, we can assume that this quantity is already bounded. Uh, plus alpha times uh, this, you know, the imitate the basically this is a like a supervised learning term here this alpha times essentially this is like the risk uh right because we're using pi k uh to generate uh the data and then we're going to basically fit pi hat k to to the data from pi k so this term is good too this term basically is a supervised learning term and the last term is l delta times the discrepancy between pi k plus one and pi k so this term is a little bit harder but this is where we're going to actually use our trust region constraint. So this is where the trust region is going to show up uh, in the third, uh, the third uh, component of the basic inequality. Okay, so, uh, so basically the, 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 what, what happens is that um, because of the way you write the update, pi k plus one is one minus alpha pi k plus alpha pi hat of k, the difference between pi k plus one and pi k is equal to alpha times pi hat uh, k minus pi k. So intuitively, if pi hat k is constrained not to be very far from pi k, then this thing is sort of well controlled. And that's really the, the key idea here, right? 
Uh, and in particular, yeah, I mean, this is effectively it, right? Because we have IGS and we have this uh, relationship here, we can upper bound this discrepancy by uh, a term here, which we will essentially bound by the trust region constraint. So this is why we have to have a trust region constraint, right? Uh, and and, and uh, uh, the, there's a difficulty is that we enforce the trust region constraint on the samples, and here the trust region constraint is over the true over the expectation. But you again, you just use uniform convergence uh, to then convert the sample inequality to a uh, uh, population inequality. So this is this is we've already seen this type of inequality before. Okay. Uh, and so that's pretty much, uh, that's pretty, the rest is kind of like stuff we've already seen before. So I'll just skip this. Uh, again, it's just uniform convergence to get the supervised learning bound. Uh, and so we kind of just plug all these things together. Uh, and then, the, you know, we do a lot of algebra. Um, one caveat though, is that the last step where we remove the expert is, is quite involved, uh, but it's, it's just tedious. Like there's no new ideas. Using all these same ideas is just a lot of uh, like, just a lot of steps. Um, but it's not like hard. Uh, so we'll, if we kind of combine all these things together, uh, we get a result that looks like this. So let's go over this result. It basically says, so it's a little bit more complicated than the behavior coding result because there's uh, some restrictions on the number of trajectories it has to be at least some quantity. Uh, the trust region constraints have to be set in an appropriate way so that uh, they, um, yeah, they just need to be set in an appropriate way. Uh, and then like the, the, the weight that you use also has to kind of be set in an appropriate way to make this all work. But um, assuming you do all that, then basically you get a bound that's like the generalization error of pi E is upper bounded by you know, uh, a term that depends on the time horizon, a term that depends on the number of epochs and a term that depends on like Q over M. So it has all the right ingredients, right? It's like the more epochs, uh, the worse this thing sort of gets. Um, that part might seem unintuitive. That part is a little bit artifact analysis, but the rest of the trends are correct. Uh, the more data, the better it gets. The less parameter, the better it gets. The more stable, the better it gets. Okay, so uh, we can do the similar comparison as in the BC case, where we drop all the dependencies except for uh, the time horizon, the Q number of parameters, and the trajectory uh, number of trajectories M, and then we get an expression here. Uh, we can basically invert this expression for this contraction case. It's essentially what it was before, which is Q over epsilon squared. Uh, in the tunable IGS case, a little bit more ugly, um, probably not sharp, most definitely not sharp, uh, but uh, you know, at least there is a, a, a upper bound. And furthermore, for some restricted range of Ps, uh, the upper bound is actually sublinear in the number, the, 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 the upper bound of the trajectory is sublinear in the horizon length P. Right. Uh, you will notice uh, if if uh, if you remember the BC bounds, the C mile bounds are actually worse than the BC bounds. But in practice, BC actually performs worse than C mile. So still, there is a little bit of a gap in our understanding. Uh, this is not quite the sharpest analysis. Like we're still missing something. Uh, which is why I didn't like dwell on this too long um, because it's not the sharpest. Uh, so I, it's still open. How do we improve this? Like, how do you make a C mile actually better than behavior cloning? Because in practice, uh, it is uh, in terms of the bounds. Okay, let's uh, let's 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 um, conclude by doing two things. One of them is I'm going to show you why imitation loss is meaningful in terms of a safety perspective, and then the second thing is we'll show some experiments, and then we'll conclude. Okay, so. Um, why is imitation loss a meaningful quantity? So suppose we have a function h that takes a trajectory, right, uh, and spits out a, say, a vector or a scalar, right? And suppose that function h is Lipschitz, right? We'll define h of pi of psi as basically the evaluation of h along a trajectory induced by the policy pi starting from initial condition psi. Now, uh, by stability or IGS of pi star, uh, we can bound the expected value between the deviation between the observable h of pi star minus the observable h on any policy pi hat by essentially a function that depends on the generalization error of pi hat. 
right? And so in particular, what this says is that if I had a small generalization error for pi hat, the performance of my observable H under the learn policy pi hat mimics and tends to equal uh, in the limit of infinite data, uh, the, uh, the, the performance of the observable H under the expert policy. So in particular, if H is encoding like, you know, the maximum, you know, size of the state you saw so far, uh, or then, then basically this can say like, you know, my learn policy state doesn't deviate so much from the maximal state uh, of the expert policy um, uh, up to, you know, the, the, the error of the, the, up to the generalization error. So, you know, uh, the smaller generalization error, the better my policy is, is mimicking any observable function of the trajectory of the extra policy. So that's kind of, you can basically derive like safety considerations from this, right? Like if, if, if your expert doesn't leave a box, then your learn policy will not leave a small, you know, inflated box. And the, the size of that inflation is governed by the imitation error or generalization error. Right. Okay, cool. So that is, um, that is why uh, imitation loss is an interesting quantity. Uh, as I mentioned before, practically speaking, we kind of just drop the IGS constraint because it's very hard to enforce it. It seems to be only necessary uh, in practice uh, when you have very small amounts of data. So if you have any reasonable amounts of data, you can just drop it. Uh, it seems like it's mostly an analysis tool. And so the open question, not only, so the two open questions, not only is it like, how do we make C mile better than BC in our bounds? Second open question is how do we analyze everything while dropping the stability constraint? And maybe this like, uh, you know, stuff that uh, was asked about these uh, uh, important sampling may be a way of sort of doing that. Um, I don't know, I think it's still very much open question. So I'm gonna conclude by showing you an experiment where uh, we ran uh, the, all the different types of behavior, uh, imitation learning algorithms, and we saw that the more unstable it is, the worse the behavior sort of got. So we're gonna study our um, uh, tunable IGS system. So this is the, uh, the definition. I'm basically gonna make it a multi-dimensional system by just kind of concatenating, you know, running a bunch of independent copies, and I link these copies together by creating a disturbance here. So I'm creating a random disturbance function H, uh, and the expert's goal is then basically to cancel out the H so that the closed loop behavior is equal to the IGS system, right? And the H, the random disturbance here, I just randomly initialize a two layer uh, neural network with no biases and uh, some small hidden width and 10H activation. Okay. So as I said before, the expert pi star is just negative H. So the expert's closed loop dynamics, you just make the second term go away and it's just this. And we know that this is IGS stable with A1 equals to one plus P uh, because of the result I showed you earlier. Okay, so now we're gonna do X imitation learning on this expert, right? And so what this first thing is showing is basically the goal. Uh, so this system here, uh, uh, sorry, this closed loop system tends to the origin at some rate. And so the expert, so the learn policy also will tend to the origin. And I'm plotting here, basically what happens when you compare the expert's final state to the imitation learn policy's final state seeded from the same initial conditions. Uh, and then we average over sort of many trials, right? And the important trend, so, so the columns here are different imitation learning algorithms. Uh, BC is behavior cloning. C mile is, is basically C mile with no constraints. Uh, C mile plus ag is, is where we actually, uh, we, we run a version of the algorithm we don't analyze where we kind of save all the data and just do imitation on all the previous history. Uh, dagger is, is dagger. Uh, and the trend here is that as we increase P or as the stability of the system gets worse, you can see that the deviation between the expert and the imitation learning algorithms also increases for all these algorithms, right? So even though Dagger outperforms DC, uh, the, you know, for a, for a fixed P, when you increase the P for both DC and Dagger, all these are getting worse, right? Uh, so this kind of shows that um, as you make the problem more unstable, uh, you do actually make all these imitation learning algorithms actually do end up suffering. Uh, these all are given the same amount of data. Uh, so there, we, we fix the number of trajectories given, and we see that the performance is actually degrading, 
right? So as, as predicted by our theory. Um, and a similar trend holds for the average imitation loss. So if you, you basically plot what's, how good was the imitation generalization error uh, estimated from data, you can see that, you know, again, while say dagger and CML alpha form behavior cloning, uh, they do all get worse as you uh, uh, increase uh, P. So for dagger and CMO, it's not monotonic. Uh, for BC, it's much more uh, uh, pronounced. Like BC is really getting worse. Uh, dagger is getting a little worse, uh, but it's not strictly monotonic in this case. Um, but um, it's, the trend is very clear for BC. Any questions here? Okay. Uh, now the last experiment, and then we can uh, we can wrap things up, uh, is uh, we basically took a, a unitree like ago in PyBullet simulation. Uh, we have an expert MPC controller which allows the like ago to walk sideways. We basically give it a fixed speed, and the expert uh, controller has, has it walk sideways with that fixed speed. Uh, and as we vary the fixed speed, we increase the linear velocity, which decreases the task stability in a qualitative way. So there's no proof here that like this is an IGS stable system. We're just kind of analyzing this qualitatively on a high dimensional system. Uh, the expert that we're using here is an MPC controller based on center of mass dynamics uh, as described in the MIT Cheetah paper. It's a solving a convex optimization problem. Uh, and we're using a neural network to basically imitate this expert. Uh, so this is kind of the centroidal mass dynamics. This is a picture of the robot. The details of this controller are not that important. The point is we're going to use a neural net to do imitation learning. Now we're going to compare behavior cloning to CMILE and CMILE plus aggregation. I omitted dagger here because of space. Uh, uh, so um, there are the three rows uh, are basically the, uh, the difference between the expert goal, uh, the expert's final Y position and the imitation learning's final uh, Y position. The second row is the survival time. So a lot of these situations, the robot actually falls down. Uh, it doesn't last the entire trajectory. And then the final row is this uh, average imitation loss. And the colors correspond to different linear speeds. So the blue is the most stable. The linear speed is 0.2. Uh, the orange, we increase the linear speed to 0.3. And the green, the linear speed is increased to 0.4. So as we transition from blue to orange to green, the uh, stability properties are getting worse. So our theory predicts that uh, the behavior cloning uh, for the fixed amount of data should uh, actually imitation learning for a fixed amount of data should all sort of get worse, right? And this is exactly the trend we see. So let's look at the behavior coding plot. We see that in the beginning, uh, the error here uh, for the blue is, is, is the lowest. When we increase the linear speed to, uh, to orange, it increases. And then also when we jack it up to green, it also increases uh, similar trends for CML and CML plus ag. Survival time, similar type of occurrence. Uh, for the smallest lin speed, the BC is able to basically not fall down the entire time. As we increase the linear speed, uh, it starts to fall down a little bit. And as we increase it to 0.4, it's falling down like more than half uh, before it can even complete half the trajectory, like a lot of the time. Uh, and imitation loss kind of follows a similar trend. Uh, Again, not always monotonically, uh, not always monotonic, um, but um, uh, the trends are certainly there. So yeah, that's uh, that's it for this experiment. Actually, I think I can just uh, basically wrap up here. I think that's it for the content. Um, we can uh, have a few minutes left. We can ask. We can basically talk about some questions or any like what are some good future ideas to work on. Just anything uh, that we want to talk about for the next five minutes. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you everyone for um, paying attention uh, uh, and attending. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Um, I don't know if there are uh, any questions from the audience. Okay, maybe, maybe I can start with a question. And All right. So, uh, so thanks a lot for the talk and, and also about like explaining us how you control like this distribution shift, like it's a very clever way. Um, 
I was I was thinking when you mentioned the safe imitation learning, like like a naive idea that came to my mind, and probably you can explain me why this would not be a good idea. But so the the distribution between the expert policy and the imitation policy hopefully would be close, right? That that would be your hope. So so the distribution shift is not an arbitrary one; it's probably a small distribution shift in some kind of of, of a metric, right? So therefore, couldn't one say like if, if if our goal is to get you know like some safety guarantees for the imitation policy that we would just you know like make some kind of robustness approach, right? We take some distributionally robust you know like uh, uncertainty set and 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 create some um, guarantees on the imitation distribution via such an approach. Yeah, would that be uh, possible? So I think your your first point of the I mean. I think your first point of the the distribution shift being small is like actually not correct uh, because okay. like here you can see right like okay let's take this like ago example right uh, let's take this green example so the distribution of the behavior cloning basically the trajectory lasts for a thousand time steps it falls at time step four hundred right okay so that is clearly not the expert is not falling at all so that's clearly a huge gap there right these distributions are nowhere the okay. same uh, so. Uh, but but however, if you do a more clever type of you know C mile uh, type of thing, even if you don't enforce any of these stability constraints, it does seem like okay, yeah, the distributions are maybe actually that are not too far apart. Um, so what exactly do you mean by um, like what what distribution robust example do you have in mind, or like distribution robust type of uh, training? I mean, I, I was more thinking that. But, but okay, I, I see your point, and you probably already like uh, kill my statement because if the distribution shift is large, right, this does not work. But let's assume, okay, we would be in a setting where you know, like the, the distribution of the imitation learner and the one of the expert are relatively close. Sure. And then my idea was that we would, you know, like the generalization bound, we, we would derive it with respect to the expert distribution. But then just put a kind of robustness ball around that distribution. Then the hope would be that since the imitation distribution also falls in this, so we would derive statistical guarantees for all distributions yeah. in this ball around the expert, right? And this would contain yeah. the imitation distribution. Yeah? And yeah. therefore the guarantees would hold. Of course, so, this would probably yeah, I mean, suffer from conservatism. A, this is actually like kind of how these proofs work. Uh, in some sense, right? Because the point is that, okay, so there's a, a, a classic uh, result, a classic inequality that says, you know, the, if I have two distributions like D1 and D2, right? Uh, but I look at the expectation, let's say these, okay, so I take an expectation of some function H, some scalar function H under D1, and I, I look at the expectation of that same scalar H under D2, I can upper bound that dis difference in expectations by uh, say two times the TV distance between distribution one, distribution two. So uh, if H, my function is like the imitation loss and D1 is the expert and D2 is the imitation policy and they are actually small, then yes, like you basically have a bound. Uh, mm -hmm. This is kind of how effectively, this is actually kind of how this proof works, right? This proof is basically uh, doing something similar to that, uh, but it's, uh, it's not just like it's, I guess the way to say it is we are sort of enforcing that the distribution shift is actually small by constraining, like by forcing everything to be stable, right? The no. first assumption of is the distribution shift actually small uh, is an assumption. And it only holds yeah. if you do something up to make that happen. Yeah. It is true that once that happens, then yeah, you can reuse your favorite okay. tool. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of how these proofs actually work. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot, yeah, very helpful. That's a good question. Yeah, because like sometimes uh, it is like not an issue, uh, but in practice, especially for behavior cloning, like mm -hmm. in, in any real non-trivial task, it's certainly an issue. Mm -hmm. I would have a question to this last example here. Um, so thanks a lot for the very interesting talk. I was wondering here, in the, the BC plots, is there a particular reason why the performance is worse for larger numbers of trajectories? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> uh, oftentimes, yeah, like BC is weird. And sometimes it like doesn't seem to benefit. Uh, basically what happens from what I can tell uh, is that it starts to really overfit, right? 
basically like in the beginning it, it, there's not enough data so the neural net doesn't overfit so much but then kind of like once once you get more and more data it really starts to overfit and that actually tends when you close the loop with the overfit in neural network that actually makes things worse now i did try to do some things to actually try and mitigate overfitting uh like uh and and but they didn't help that much uh so i think it's just uh it's uh, it's basically you know we're training a neural network here uh we don't always actually like you know training neural networks is hard right so it's not like we're actually literally solving these erm problems so uh it, we actually somehow like when we have small amounts of data we actually get some regularization from that in a way that actually performs better uh, uh and that i don't understand very well thank you Okay, is there any other question from the audience? I, I think if not, we should really would like to thank you again, Stephen, for this very interesting talk, both to you and Nicola and your morning. And really, thanks, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, okay, if there is no, no more questions, uh, we will see you again tomorrow, uh, 8.30 for, for the next day on the, on the summer school. Uh, so see you, see you all there tomorrow. Yeah, thank you everyone. I will send these, I'll, I'll send the slides to like, someone and, and I'll hopefully, uh, yeah, so uh, yeah. Great, that, that would be nice. And then, then we can also share with the, with the people. Yeah, I'll, the... I'll send these slides out. I'll clean up some of the typos and send them out. So appreciate it. Thank you. It was a pleasure to, for both of us, me and Nikolai, to give this uh, lectures. Thank Great. you. Thank, thanks a lot. Thank you Bye. very much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.